Yeah. Ivan, please go ahead. A uh, very warm welcome to everyone on this afternoon in Vienna and Europe, and uh, a very warm welcome to our two speakers, Bruce Stokes and Richard Parker, who are in the US. Uh, so good morning to, to both of you. Uh, my name is Ivan Bevoda. I'm a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences, where I lead the Europe's Futures program. I welcome you on behalf of the four institutions that organize uh, these events and, and press uh, briefings and discussions. So on behalf of Concordia, the oldest press club in the world here in Vienna, of FUME, the Forum for Journalism and Media, uh, and Media Tomic will be the co-host of this event and introduce the speakers and lead the discussion. IWM, the Institute for Human Sciences, where I am, and last but not least, our, our generous funder, the Erste uh, Foundation here in Vienna. So I look forward very much to, the, to this event. Um, we always try to be uh, dynamic and, of course, substantive. We have an hour and a half, so I will hand it over to Milena Tomic, who is my partner in crime here. Thank you very much, Ivan. Hopefully not in crime. Uh, uh, good morning to our speakers, Bruce and Richard. Good afternoon to most uh, participants. My name is Mirjana Tomic. I am a former journalist and I now organize and moderate seminars on politics and media, uh, mostly uh, focusing Euro uh, on Europe. I work for Forum Journalismo su Medien Dien and uh, Presse Club Concordia. Uh, Understanding the US is very important, especially when uh, we deal with Ukraine, the war with Ukraine, which is uh, very close to us, but where the US is taking a very, uh, assuming a very active role. Uh, I would like to say that one of the key elements of all of our seminars and talks is understanding the local contexts. No matter how uh, aware we are or how much we read, it is not always read, uh, easy to understand the context. And in the case of the United States, we somehow all assume we know the country, especially if we read the New York Times, see films and watch CNN, we assume we know it. However, when you're in the spot, it all looks a bit different. A month ago, I was in the US and the war in Ukraine had a uh, totally different angle. Even physically, along the East Coast, there were so many Ukrainian flags. Here in Vienna, we don't have uh, Ukrainian flags. We have Ukrainians. So it's a totally different, uh, let's say, context. So uh, as I was observing how the war, which is very close to us here, uh, uh, how it looked to me from the US angle. Uh, first, it was not very clear to me what the final objective of the war is. It seemed to me like a bit of a moving target. Then is there a bipartisan unanimity in support of the Biden policies? Then is it the war to liberate Ukraine or is it a war between Washington and Moscow? Today, a Russian-American author, Anastasia Edel, wrote uh, uh, as a guest commentator in the New York Times, the two countries, uh, once allies in war against Nazi Germany, are effectively fighting a proxy war. Further, Europe is somehow absent when one is on the American uh, con uh, continent from the radar when one monitors war development developments, unless one reads the New York Times and Washington Post, but most people, uh, I don't think, uh, do it. At the same time, both uh, I have observed, and I would like our speakers to, uh, to dwell on that, that both papers are starting to raise doubts regarding the US involvement, uh, uh, whether, uh, ha what, what is happening with the weapons, uh, can they be smuggled, this was Washington Post, uh, then New York Times published yesterday, I think, uh, that, they, uh, that uh, US intelligence uh, services know more about uh, the Russian intentions than the Ukrainian intentions, and I'm wondering if there is some sort of a change uh, uh, in the attitude. So uh, this uh, event today is really meant to understand the US side and from two angles. One, the attitude of the voters, and two, to set this uh, uh, US involvement or US policies towards the war in Ukraine and deliverance of weapons within the US uh, political context. Uh, for that, we have two best possible speakers. One is Bruce Stokes from the German Marshall Fund, uh, we are. We should immediately uh, post his CV so you can see his entire uh, CV. 
He was uh, formerly from 2012 to 2012 uh, uh, a director of Global Economic Attitudes at the Pew Research uh, Center in Washington. And he, he will talk about the US attitudes and opinions and Richard Parker lecturer in public policy at Harvard Kennedy School of Government as well as senior fellow of the school uh, of the school's Schorenstein Center on Media Polit uh, Politics and Public Policy. Uh, uh, Richard's CV is really long. My colleague will post it now, so uh, please look at it. And just very practical things, the format, each speaker will have about 20 minutes uh, to uh, explore their top respective topics, and then we shall go as usually uh, to live uh, uh, Q&A. Thank you so much, and uh, please, Bruce, the floor or the screen is yours. Thank you, uh, Mirana, and, and thank you, Ivan, an old colleague from German Russia Fund. Good to see you again. And, and Richard, uh, good, good, to, good to be with you today. Um, so what I'm going to try to do, is, as uh, was mentioned, is to uh, share with you some public opinion data that we have on uh, the um, uh, attitudes of the American public uh, towards the Ukraine uh, war uh, and the Russian invasion, and uh, to uh, talk a little bit about the role of public opinion, at least as I see it, uh, uh, in uh, this U.S. debate about what we do going forward. Um, uh, a couple of uh, cautionary notes. Uh, uh, Ipsos came out with a poll just this morning um, asking people what are the most important issues facing the country, 2% said war, the war. 29% uh, said the economy. Uh, so whatever views Americans have about the war in Ukraine and the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we have to put it in the context of relativity and uh, how relatively important is this to people. Um, uh, Secondly, I think we have to understand that uh, most people have not thought about this a great deal. Uh, it is um, my experience in conducting polls first for the German Marshall Fund and then at the Pew Research Center is that when I was a journalist for 30 years, I, I wanted to know what people knew and how they felt strongly about this issue or that issue. After 10 years of polling, I was disabused of that idea. I think that we have to assume very low levels of knowledge and that the best polling questions and the best polling results evoke emotion, not reason, and that we shouldn't look down on that. I mean, people, people buy a blue car rather than a red car because they like blue, even though it's the same car under the hood. They go into the voting booth and vote and vote on emotion, not reason. And so as we look at these polling results, we should think about what emotion this may be, their answers may be reflecting. You know, that said and done, Pew did a survey a couple of weeks ago, and 56% of the public knew that Ukraine was not a member of NATO, which actually was a surprisingly high number. So there's, it's not as if there's no knowledge of, of what uh, is going on uh, in Ukraine. Um, but I, I think probably the most telling thing about the polling results is that in scouring the various polls that have done by the major polling organizations in America, there has not been a series of questions about the Ukraine war in a month, which suggests that the public, the, the pollsters believe the public has moved on and uh, they're probably right. Uh, I know as a pollster, I'm not going to waste questions asking people about things they don't they aren't paying attention to. I got more important things to do as a pollster. So I think that um, uh, the fact that the economy has taken over, fears of inflation, uh, gun violence has taken over as an issue, uh, the recurrence of COVID, a whole series of things have uh, captured more of the public attention most recently. At least it's, it, it, that's the assumption being made by pollsters. And I think we have to, uh, to realize that as we look at this, these numbers. Um, now, this is a survey that asks, you know, uh, views of Russia, which I think is, is important as we, we think about this. Uh, the views of Russia have come, become very negative in the United States. Uh, they were 
better as recently as two years ago, uh, where at the end of the Trump administration, uh, only 41% of the public had an unfavorable view of Russia. It's now 69%. What is interesting is that the um, percentage of Republicans who have a very unfavorable view of Russia has doubled. Um, Democrats who are who are more slightly more negative towards Russia, there has also increased, and they're they're still more negative towards Russia. But the real movement has been among Republicans. Um, nearly two and three Americans see Russia's power and influence as a major threat. Uh, that's up seventeen percentage points since twenty twenty. Uh, but again, we have to see the concern about Russia relative to other things, and these are all international threats. Uh, uh, to the United States, and uh, two thirds are say it's a major threat. The Russia is a major threat, but it uh, is dwarfed by other concerns. Uh, what is interesting here is that the percentage of Americans who say that Russia is an enemy has gone up dramatically. Uh, enemy is a pretty loaded word, um, and um, so there is this heightened uh, sense of. Uh, concern about the threat that Russia uh, poses. Um, this is a polling result that actually surprised me, to be honest. Um, it was asked by the Brookings Institution and uh, the University of Maryland. Uh, and uh, six in 10 uh, Republicans and seven, almost seven in 10 Democrats said what really most upset them uh, about the Ukraine situation was basically uh, Russia trying to change borders by force. Now, this is an argument that very early on was made by the administration. I must admit, I thought mm, it's a little sophisticated question for people to understand, but it would appear that this is what the public is actually very concerned about, uh, that, that using force to change borders is, and it, and it is significant if we think about the implication for other issues that um, if, for example, China would attempt to seize Taiwan, there may be in this some evidence that the American public would be equally upset about China trying to change borders uh, by force. Hard to say, it's speculation. Um, this is a question that the Associated Press has asked. Uh, we actually asked it at Pew. I was the one who wrote the question years ago. Uh, and we, they found the same thing we found consistently. The American public is willing to live up to its Article 5 uh, responsibilities and its obligations. Um, notice that Democrats are much more committed to those Article 5 uh, um, commitments than are Republicans, but still half of Republicans said they're willing to go to the defense of a NATO ally if they're attacked by Russia. Uh, and uh, the more recent question in terms of uh, never being asked really before the Ukraine invasion, uh, there is consistent uh, nonpartisan uh, belief that we should not uh, send troops uh, to, uh, to Ukraine, American troops to Ukraine. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Um, what? Not sure, sure why I... Well, I'm getting that. Um, let me go back. I apologize. <laughs> Something has happened here. There we go. Um, when uh, Americans are asked, uh, should the U.S. play a major or minor role in the war, uh, notice that, I mean, the question's been asked by the Associated Press now uh, three times. Every month, the percentage of Americans who say we should play a major role has gone down a bit. Um, and uh, it's only about a third who say that now. That It's always been a plurality who say we should play a minor role. It's hard to know how people think about minor versus major, but clearly there's a worry about getting too involved uh, in um, uh, the war. And um, notice that Democrats uh, are actually, in a plurality sense, 
more supportive of a minor role in the most recent poll than they have been in the past. Uh, and, uh, the, and the change has been really um, uh, from the percentage who said a major role in March among Democrats, that's come down 11 percentage points by May. Um, one of the reasons I think Americans don't want to get play a major role is they have concerns about, about what could happen. Uh, they're worried about uh, both in a bipartisan way, worried about the war expanding to other European countries. They're worried about the economic uh, impact on, on uh, the United States. And bear in mind, this survey was done at the end of April. My guess is if you ask the same question today, people would even be more worried about the economic sanctions having an impact on uh, the American economy. Obviously, this takes place in a political context. What does this mean for the Biden administration? How do people think the Biden administration is handling uh, the situation? Um, I think, again, one has to see this overall and in, in the context of attitudes towards the Biden administration. Um, the president seems to be stuck in the low 40s in terms of his approval, overall approval rating. Um, and as you'll see in some of these questions, I think it's not at all clear when the question is asked of the public whether the most important thing in the question is the word Biden or what the topic of the question is. Uh, and are we picking up more anti-Biden sentiment than we're picking up an attitude? But I'll show you this in some of the questions. Um, now, in general, the public has been very supportive of doing more to help uh, Ukraine, uh, whether we're talking about placing stricter economic sanctions or sending military equipment, uh, or stationing more tr troops in NATO countries uh, close to the uh, Ukraine border. Um, and it, it's a fairly bipartisan support, uh, Democrats being slightly more supportive in all cases of these three questions than Republicans, but it's not that Republicans were not supportive. Um, by mid-May, the other had been an April poll, by mid-May there was still strong approval for almost every kind of aid, Again, accept troops, sending troops to Ukraine. The answer I think that needs bear watching going forward is the final question at the bottom there, sending government funds directly to Ukraine, which let's face it, that may be one of the next things that comes up for consideration. Uh, if and when the issue of reconstructing Ukraine becomes a concern in the West, uh, as it already is, but it, it's still in a discussion phase. Um, notice that that there is not much support among Republicans in the United States. Only twenty eight percent of sending directly sending money to the Ukraine government. Uh, what this says about the future of a quote unquote Marshall Plan for Ukraine, I don't know, but I think it bears watching that there seems to be a strong partisan difference there in the United States about uh, directly aiding the, the Ukraine government. Um, and uh, if you ask, this was a separate question asked by the Washington Post, uh, strong support for a variety of different things, except again, except taking direct military action against Russian forces. Um, it's interesting. Americans um, in May, about a third of Americans said we're not doing enough to help the Ukrainians. Um, about a third said we're doing about the right thing. Notice that the not doing enough has gone down. I think there is a growing recognition we're doing a lot. And we may, in the future, if you project that ahead, there may be a growing sense of people saying, too much. Now it's only 12% in May who said too much. So we're a long way from a majority, but it that has grown in terms of people thinking that we, we have done at least enough and maybe a little bit, some say too much. Um, this is an interesting question. It was asked by Pew recently. Um, should we send natural gas to Europe? Uh, notice that the word Ukraine is not in the question. So the rationale for doing this is not in the question. 
So you do have to wonder whether the 70 percent of Republicans will say, yes, we should send more uh, natural gas to Europe, whether they are thinking about helping Europe in its natural gas shortage issues or whether this is just about exports are good and we can earn more money by doing this and becoming an export power. So I do think it is interesting. And oh, by the way, for those of you who are listening, uh, uh, it, the news overnight was that one of the major LNG facilities in the United States has had an explosion and it'll be offline for three weeks. So uh, this uh, natural gas uh, situation is gonna get worse. Um, and another reason to worry about America's steadfastness on natural gas exports is that uh, 67% of the Americans in this Pew poll said they were worried about the impact of natural gas prices in the United States if we sent more gas to Europe. Uh, so as natural gas prices rise in the US, support for sending more to, to Europe may go down. Um, what does this mean uh, for Biden, all of this? Um, as you can see, his net approval on the Biden administration's response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, is you know, less than 50%, but it's, yeah, it's close to 50%. It's gone down two percentage points, which is the margin of error. I wouldn't worry about that so much. It actually, between March and May, support among Republicans actually went up a little bit whereas the real decline was among Democrats, uh, but yet overwhelmingly Democrats support what the Biden administration is doing. Again, you got to worry about whether this is a more of a reflection of attitudes towards Biden or about attitudes about how he's handling Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Two weeks later, however, in a different poll, structured differently, a three-way question, not a four-way question, you get far less uh, confidence in Biden's handling of the situation. Now, again, for those of you who don't work with polling data every day, it is always important to stop and think about how the question was asked. A three-way question will give you very different results than a four-way question. Uh, and it, it, it's like comparing apples to oranges. But notice that 76% of Republicans say they have hardly any confidence in Biden's handling of the situation in Ukraine. And it does raise questions, I think, about whether the operative word in that question is Biden or Ukraine. Because one can be very critical of the Biden administration about their handling of Afghanistan. You can be upset that they can't do anything about inflation, which the president of the United States can't. Um, I. I will admit I voted for Biden, but I still can't. I, it's hard for me to, to know why you think he screwed up Ukraine. I, it just It's hard to imagine that. So it may well be that this is just the partisanship in the United States, which is, as you all know, is so, so deeply uh, divisive of our country right now. Uh, so that uh, is an overview of public opinion. Uh, I look forward to our conversation. And over to you, Richard. Bruce, thank you. That was a tremendous introduction to American attitudes currently about the war. What I'm going to do is rather than talk about uh, the American public's attitudes, is try to provide a little historical political context uh, for the way I think about this and way others uh, uh, may think about it as well that would be helpful to European journalists. Uh, the first is to understand that the United States itself, in terms of war, has not actually had foreign troops on continental U.S. territory since 1812. Uh, and in that, in that period of time since 1812, we have deployed troops in 11 declared war, I'm sorry, five declared wars that I can think of, and in over 100 instances in which war was not declared. Uh, so the United States' idea of war is something that goes on somewhere else and isn't directly experienced by Americans because we haven't had the experience of foreign troops shelling us, bombing us, uh, uh, shooting us, any of the experiences which so many Europeans and so many people around the world have. The second is that we have enjoyed a global hegemonic status, one we shared with the Soviet Union for a period of time, but in which there was no question that the United States was 
one of the two great global powers, and that given the modern reach of uh, military weaponry, uh, really was a global power uh, in a way that could deploy vast uh, amounts of power uh, uh, very quickly. Um, the United States, however, is like all countries, a process that is always in evolution. And we, since the fall of the Soviet Union, have been searching for an American purpose that would ideologically provide sort of a master key understanding for us going forward. Um, the use of foreign threat as a master key has been an important one in American history and nowhere more important than in the 20th century and particularly in the period after the Second World War when surprisingly Americans were not keen to embrace what comes to be called the Cold War. Uh, and if you polled America, I'm sure Bruce has studied this, but if you polled American opinion in 1946, uh, there was no sign that the United States public was looking for a prolonged half century conflict that would cost trillions of dollars and risk nuclear destruction of the planet going forward. They thought, oh, well, Roosevelt seems to have been able to work with Stalin. Perhaps we can find some modus vivendi uh, that would work in the 1940s and 1950s. And it was never a sense of we trust the Russians or we trust the Soviets, but it was a sense that we had a power of our own emblemized by uh, our un unilateral possession of nuclear weapons that gave us the ability to, in, in effect, dictate choices for the rest of the world, which we then went about doing for quite a long period of time. The Europeans are familiar with being dictated to or persuasively cajoled, depending on how you want to construct that relationship. Uh, and what I want to focus on, however, is that our ability to act in that unilateral fashion in, an, in, a, re, in a repetition of sort of the high points of American power in the, Amer in the 1950s to 1970s is for now gone off the table. And so there is a sense in which this war comes at a moment when what the United States will be as a war party in this situation is neither stable nor entirely clear. And Biden has been able to do what he's been able to do for reasons that Bruce is pointing out in uh, uh, this polling data, which is the American public had a kind of very predictable American response, which is big guy picks on little guy, we Americans will always stand up for little guy. And so I was stunned by the scope of the embrace of the American pushback against the initial Russian invasion. I would have expected just declarations of fury from the American left about there we go again, American imperialism, da 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 da. And from the American right that Biden should be sending troops, Biden should be putting boots on the ground. That didn't happen. There was a, for a moment, uh, what I'd call a 95 or 98% consensus uh, that we were doing the right thing in supplying support to the Ukraine and brave little Ukraine, little being only 40 million people instead of 300 million, brave little Ukraine was going to fight uh, against uh, the, big, uh, the big bully in Moscow. The problem is we're now 100 days into that war. And like other wars that we have fought in the past, Americans are not good at paying attention to long wars. However, we have to understand also that both Iraq and uh, Afghanistan are reminders that even when the United States public is no longer paying attention to a war, if there is a modicum of consensus in American elites that that war is important for larger geostrategic or geo-ideological reasons, that it's very likely that that war will continue. And what I'm concerned about on a humanitarian level is the price that uh, particularly Ukrainians, but indirectly Europeans and Europeans, particularly in Eastern Europe, are going to pay uh, in this new period that we're moving into, because my own sense is that this, Bruce is absolutely right, that the Ukraine and the war, Putin's war, as it's commonly called here, uh, are losing uh, a sense of importance 
for the great majority of Americans. It, it's not a cold calculated indifference, but it's a sense rather of we've got our own problems. They're very large problems. They're problems of the economy. They're problems of the polity. They're problems of profound division uh, among us. Although I constantly remind my students, there has never been a time when the United States was actually united. Um, and so it's important for Europeans not to be fooled into the idea that just because January 6th occurred, the United States is falling apart. There will be more January 6s in American future, but I don't think that it is a sign that we're falling apart. We have other problems to deal with. So what is this in terms of usefulness for uh, European journalists? I think several things. One, they should pay close attention to Bruce's data uh, on uh, public opinion and recognize that uh, 100 days out, uh, American public opinion as such is shifting to other topics. And uh, it's not going to wheel back to Ukraine anytime soon, absent some dramatic breakthrough. Uh, and the dramatic breakthrough might be the sudden resignation of Zelensky, the deployment of a nuclear tactical uh, weapon by the Russians. I mean, I can create a small list. The idea that our attention will be drawn back just because people not in America are getting inadequate amount of grain from Ukraine is not going to make a difference, frankly, in American opinion. That said, going forward, it's not clear to me that the Republicans have an agenda that would be largely different in consequence than what is being executed now by the, the Democrats. Uh, that is, I don't see the Republicans, should they take office in 2006, proposing a, a, a massive pullback or a quote unquote abandonment because the United States and the middle, uh, the middle of the road press will excoriate them about the old who lost China failure of the Democrats in the 1940s and the failure of Biden in Afghanistan with the, with the sudden collapse of the Afghan government in the wake of US withdrawal of troops. So I think we're in for a, a rather brutal period of time in which what the European press has to interpret for European readers and viewers is the fact that American official support is not likely to wane in the near future. In fact, it may continue to increase that the United States is fully prepared to use this situation to accomplish policy goals that are not specific to uh, this war, but are policy goals that the US has held in a bipartisan way for a number of years. An example would be greater GDP expenditure on military power by the Europeans, something that the Europeans have historically resisted till now. So that pressure will continue and the amplification of that pressure will be justified by the look at what Moscow is doing. Moscow won't stop with the uh, western border of the Donbass. It could very well be headed for the western border of France if we don't stop it now. So that, that is going to play an important role. The second is that there is a question, I think, about where petroleum and petroleum prices are going to play for both Europe and the United States. My own experience of the 1970s and the two gargantuan price hikes of the 1970s was that it, um, they unleashed uh, dramatic problems economically for which economic advisors to governments lacked uh, uh, tools, effective tools uh, for addressing the problem. So I think that what, what European journalists have got to anticipate is that this war as a military conflict on the ground is very swiftly metastasizing into other larger forms of conflict and that interpreting that conflict for their readership, viewership will in no small part depend on what their national interest is, the relationship of their national interest to other national and regional interests in Europe, and in a sense, uh, uh, what it is that they're going to interpret their own elites as being willing to accept or embrace as part of this prolonged, and I think really quite awful war that is now going on in Ukraine. 
So let me stop there and uh, and turn it back to you. Uh, 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 thank you so much, uh, Bruce. Thank you so much, Richard. Before I ask uh, uh, the audience uh, uh, to uh, ask questions live or they just have to put up their hand, I would like to ask you something. There are a couple of things I would like to ask you, Richard. One thing is, uh, I'm not sure if I understood you correctly, but there is sort of a decoupling between uh, the falling support or the po uh, of the importance of the war in Ukraine for the American public, but at the same time, the US uh, maintaining the same level or increasing the support or military support for Ukraine. Did I get it correctly? How did this two uh, uh, play? Uh, well, so this is uh, democratic theory processed through political science over the last half century. And the general conclusion is that the United States foreign policy is not determined by popular attitude. It is determined by elite consensus and uh, is redirected as a consequence of elite disagreement for which the public support is sought and invoked to justify a particular elite uh, 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 group opinion. Is that what you were looking for? Uh, well, uh, yes, but uh, you know, I'm not an economist and you are. Is there enough money for everything to be spending billions on weapons on Ukraine at the same time, uh, uh, you know, introducing, implementing social programs in the US with the rising, rising inflation and uh, economic uh, uh, problems or, econ or the perception that economic problems are among the most important? Well, I am an economist, but please don't burden me with that uh, uh, epithet too, uh, too often. Uh, what I would say is that it's really, we live in a stale uh, environment for political argument. There is a caricature of the Democratic and Republican parties as the Democrats being for big government and the Republicans being for small government. The, the, the largest point that American government reached between the Second World War and the coming of the Great Recession uh, was under Ronald Reagan, uh, not under Lyndon Johnson, not under John F. Kennedy, and not under Bill Clinton. Both parties are parties of big government. The second is that the United States government grew big and permanently big in a period after the Second World War and up and through the Vietnam War because of military spending. Across the 1950s and early 1960s, half of all federal spending in the United States was carried out by the Pentagon. Now, we can talk about that till the cows come home. All I want to do is emphasize that right now, the, the Pentagon's budget, if what you do is incorporate veterans costs and some other things, is well over a trillion dollars. Uh, so the question of whether we have the money uh, seems not to be the question. Uh, what we have now is a permanent military caste system within the United States that worries many within both the military and in the civilian community that is meant to regulate the military because it is a military that is increasingly isolated in its experience from the overall uh, uh, polity uh, in which we live. And that historically is never a good thing. But I don't think that I'm particularly worried about whether America has enough money to carry on its part of this war. I don't think that's, that's a determinant. Will it be used to, uh, by Republicans and moderates like uh, Senator Manchin from West Virginia to argue against child tax credits or universal pre-kindergarten enrollment? Absolutely, in that case, we don't have enough money. Uh, if you think that it's going to be uh, uh, used to cut the number of nuclear-powered aircraft carriers, which we are committed to building, I think we have plenty of money, so. Thank you, and just one thing to you, Bruce. Uh, do you think that American public understands uh, uh, the final objective of this war? Well, first off, uh, to, to further Richard's point on to your first question, um, the, the debate in Washington to date, at least as far as I've been able to follow it, has not framed it the way you suggested, right? That we can't afford to do this much for Ukraine and still do the social. The, the social 
programs, the uh, Biden administration's bill that would have increased dramatically, very, it's, you know, the social infrastructure of the United States died of its own accord because people were afraid of either they ideologically didn't like it or Manchin used the excuse that we don't want to increase the deficit, even though it was reducing the deficit. I mean, things of that nature. Whether in the future it might become an issue, uh, an, an excuse for people to vote against social programs, uh, I think is possible. Uh, mm -hmm. But as to date, it has not become an issue. Um, and as Richard said, um, the, the Pentagon has very deep pockets. So, um, but I, I could imagine at some point, the generals going to Congress and saying, you know, we need this new aircraft carrier and we can't keep supplying this equipment to, to Ukraine at the same time uh, because their own internal priorities will get challenged. That may be where some of the pressure comes from. Um, now, to, to your question, if you could repeat it, so I'm- Yes, the question was, is it, uh, uh, do you think that the American public is clear what the, or that the American are. politicians and policymakers state clearly the objective of this war? No, I think that, as, as Richard said, uh, we like the idea of perceiving ourselves as standing up for the little guy against the big guy. And, oh, by the way, the big guy is this Russia and it's Putin. It's a lot of memory of the Soviet Union. You know, these are uh, not good people. And so we're, we're happy to stand with Ukrainians. Um, I think that the, the bigger issue will be and we're beginning to see these questions, as you mentioned in your introduction, rise in the press. See, what, what really are the objectives of the Ukrainian government? Um, uh, what will they be satisfied with? Uh, there hasn't been as much conversation about that yet as I anticipate there will be, as this becomes a, a pro more prolonged conflict, assuming it does. Um, and, um, you know, I think that Zelensky, who has, who has, developed a huge following in the United States and he's been incredibly successful. I mean, it is it is good to have a showman as your, as your leader in these well, situations. Excuse me, you do know he has American uh, advisors, uh, oh, two yes. uh, PR firms that are yeah, advising yeah, I mean, him. But, but the point is, I think he has, he has an intuitive sense of how to do this. But the, but the question will be, do people begin to question whether the sacrifice of lives, of civilian lives, which it would appear that the Russians have no inhibitions about just killing civilians uh, uh, at will, right? Uh, pulverizing cities and killing anyone in them. At what point will, will there be questions begin to arise in the United States and in Ukraine about whether the principle of the sovereignty of Ukraine is worth the cost? Uh, uh, but again, <laughs> I think. Right now, Americans realize that it takes two to tango, as we say in English, and Putin is not willing to negotiate. So I think that's going to be one of the challenges. Thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, uh, if there are any hands, if not, uh, uh, while I'm waiting for some hands to raise, I'm sure Ivan will have uh, many questions. Ivan Bebodem. What are you showing? Ivan, uh, turn on the, uh, the microphone. No, I said let let others ask questions. I mean, uh, I think yes, of course, but I don't see any raised hand, so that's why I'm asking. Oh, yes, uh, there is there uh, Roman. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. We know you, but please introduce yourself. Sure. G uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Roman Gerardimos. I'm a professor of global current affairs at Bournemouth University, and I also write a column for a Greek newspaper. Uh, thank you both for these amazing, uh, very informative. Uh, presentations, they really uh, enriched our, our understanding. I, 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 my question is, if you have thought about any scenarios of escalation, I mean, I guess the context to your presentations is not necessarily de-escalation, maybe de-escalation in rhetoric uh, globally, or maybe on the part of Putin, but have you thought of any escalation scenarios and how these might affect uh, public opinion in attitudes, or is that, is that even an equation, uh, what happens on the ground, or what happens rhetorically, in Europe with, with public opinion. So is it so mediated by pol uh, politicians' rhetoric that it really doesn't matter what happens in reality? Uh, I, I guess it's like a two- Thank Well, you. I mean, I think, I mean, 
one of the experiences we can draw on is what happened in Syria, uh, where there was a chemical weapons use. <clears throat> and um, at least people in the United States uh, were uh, you know, upset about that, but they still did not want the Obama administration to intervene. Um, and the Obama White House surprisingly didn't intervene, even though they were every the entire government was ready for the intervention. They had decided they thought we were going to intervene, um, which I think might suggest that even if there were documented cases of use of at least chemical weapons, the public would be horrified, but still would not want to escalate. Now. We, you know, we have no experience with people using tactical nuclear weapons, uh, but I do think at least we we would have to anticipate that at least some Americans would say that's horrible. Uh, it shouldn't have been done. It's outrageous. But the escalation then would be for us to use tactical nuclear weapons, and that could lead to a nuclear holocaust. So I do think that. Uh, there would be a great reluctance to go down that escalatory road if the Russians started down that road. And, I, and that would, of course, give the Russians a tactical advantage because they may make a judgment that they can get away with it. And they may be right. But Richard may have different views on this. No, I don't have different views. I would have complementary views. And I guess what I'd emphasize are a couple of things, one of which is for the time being on the Ukrainian side, the Ukrainian state has been able to control its military forces more or less. As this war goes on, I would expect the emergence of irregular forces operating with their own agenda because they feel somehow that the Zelensky government is not doing the right thing by whatever their metrics are. And the ability of those irregulars to then begin imposing costs across the Ukrainian border in Russia uh, or through specific sorts of attacks on rear, uh, uh, rear guard, uh, rear uh, position troops, uh, et cetera, et cetera, could very well be the excuse for uh, uh, Moscow to escalate um, on its side. Uh, so I think there's that uh, issue. I think there's a potential at some point for uh, uh, to feel that it's being pushed back so hard that it will actually allow conflict, com combat to bleed across the border into Russia, which it has not on its side allowed to happen to date, except for a couple of sort of either accidental or deliberately accidental uh, uh, incursions. Um, the third is, I think that we underestimate the degree to which natural gas and oil are a form of chemical weaponry um, and the cutoff of uh, natural gas in to Western Europe in a, in, a, in a way that precipitated a very specific, harsh uh, recessionary consequence um, could, I think, have a tremendous impact uh, on, uh, on this war uh, and its direction. I mean, I think that right now I'm trying to think of what the terms are that the two sides could come to. I, I, I want to tell myself that, that the Western Donbass is being sought by Putin, not for permanent occupation, but as a bargaining chip uh, for holding on to the Eastern Donbass plus uh, the shores of the Black Sea uh, west to maybe Odessa, I don't know. Um, but I don't see the Ukraine getting back its pre, uh, it, it, it's pre sort of secessionary uh, uh, territory in the East. Um, and I don't know what uh, uh, Zelensky is facing in terms of political pressures from various factions that are behind him in terms of the terms of, uh, of settlement. And so I, I think that we're going to see a continuation of some fairly brutal uh, military combat for uh, well into 2023 and probably 2024 and maybe 2025 before these two parties begin to come closer to a ceasefire. And just to add to that, I think if, if Richard's right, and I, I agree with him, I think I'm actually been surprised that the Ukrainian government has not done more in Russia 
than it has at the, yep. and how, how you kind of resist that pressure if you begin to get desperate i don't i don't know but the point being that we don't know how the american public would react to that where if, if it became evident that the ukrainians are taking the fight to the russians in russia right. will the public say whoa that's provocative you're expanding the war and we don't support this or go get them right i mean i but i think that i i guess i would if I had to make a bet, I think the public might see that as a dangerous escalation by Ukraine, which they wouldn't support. Uh, now, if, Sylv if Sylvester Stallone were in charge of those Ukrainian <laughs> troops, that might produce a different reaction. But that's to be a little too sardonic here. So, uh, Are there any uh, other questions? Just uh, raise your hand and or, or, or put uh, uh, your name in, uh, Ivan. Yeah, uh, well, uh, an obvious question that imposes itself, uh, given the adage that all politics is local, how does this play into the midterms? I don't, I don't think it does at this point, at least. Uh, there are so many other issues that kind of crowd this out. Um, uh, first and foremost is that um, uh, the American people, I think, increasingly are uh, impatient <laughs> with government. And uh, if you look at the 12 elections between 1952 and 1964, because we have an election every two years, uh, in those 12 elections, there was a change of the House, the Senate, or the White House, or maybe more than one of those in three of those elections. In the last 11 of these elections, we've had eight changes of government, and we're about to have a ninth because I think the House of Representatives will definitely become Republican. Mm -hmm. So is this about, about any issue or is this just the Americans have no, <laughs> no sense of, of their ability to, that this, these issues are hard and it might take a lot longer to solve them. People just want to uh, have, they're going to try something else. And um, so I think that's the major force driving whatever happens in November. Uh, Biden's low popularity doesn't help uh, when presidents have had this kind of low uh, popularity going into a midterm election. I think the average loss of seats is 30 or 50. I mean, it's, it's some huge number. Um, and so I think the House is lost. The Senate may be lost. We just don't know. Um, I think our listeners, as those who observe American politics should understand that once the Republicans are in control of one or both of the houses of Congress, they will launch investigations of the Biden administration. Uh, and that unfortunately, this will tie the government and the city in knots and the journalistic community will be tied in knots as well. And this will become the issue of the day every day for a while, uh, whether or not an investigation comes up with anything. Remember, the Republicans investigated the Benghazi die killing of three American diplomats for like two years and found nothing, but uh, it became an ongoing drama. Um, so I do think that uh, America's, the, at least the elite in Washington, press and non-press, will be increasingly preoccupied with that. Um, uh, I don't see Ukraine being an issue in the fall elections whatsoever, unless there's some dangerous escalation. Richard? Well, I'd say basically the same thing. I don't at this moment see the issue of Ukraine as such playing a determinative role in any uh, uh, major way. It might in one or two uh, instances uh, uh, where there are large Polish American populations in the Illinois or uh, Wisconsin areas, but other than that, no, I, I don't, I don't see it uh, as being all that significant. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, please uh, ask the question and please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, <laughs> I'm from Austria, but I'm German, and. Uh, I'm a journalist too, not a political journalist, but I'm politically interested. And what is the, my question is, what is the opinion of the Americans of the, the role the Europeans play in supporting the Ukraine? 
are they are they thinking that they uh, share the, the the biggest part or do they expect more support from the Europeans? Thank you. I don't well, think it's a, a European war, you know. I don't think that Americans think much about Western European support as such. Um, I think that they operate in a fairly simplistic binary fashion, which is, are the Germans, the French, and the British cooperating with what we want to see happen, or are they not? Uh, that would be uh, the determinative question for uh, most. Um, and as I tried to emphasize, uh, I don't think that what the American public thinks about this issue is determinative of how American support will continue to evolve. I think that this is a, an elite consensus issue that is going to be fought out in a further charged elite situation that Bruce describes when I think the Republicans take over the House and if they also take over the Senate. So and look, I, I agree with that. I think that uh, I know of no public opinion question that probed whether people actually can appreciate what Europeans are doing or what the public in European is, Europe is suffering. I mean, I, I would be shocked if Americans know that the inflation rate in Europe is higher than it is in the United States. Uh, because, you know, it's always woe is us and, you know, we bear all these world burdens. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I would say, I again agree with Richard that uh, the American elites, I think, have been almost uniformly um, appreciative, surprised, um, uh, heartened by the fact that Western Europe has, for the most part, uh, Western and Eastern Europe, uh, united in, in their actions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's some concerns about the Germans, but then the Germans have come forward and made some, some major initiatives. Um, there are worries among elites whether European unity is sustainable. And obviously the issue with Hungary is, is uh, one that people in, among elites are, are aware of, uh, very heartened that Finland and Sweden want to join NATO. Uh, again, a little bit surprised, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I know we at Pew used to regularly ask the Swedes if they want to join NATO, and a majority regularly said no. <laughs> so um, I do think that, um, so the elites are actually quite appreciative of what's happened in, 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 in Western Europe. Um, but a little bit wary because the elites also understand how divided Europe has been on other issues in the past. Um, and, but if Europe can maintain this unity, um, I think that is going to be have long term um, positive consequences for the transatlantic relationship because I think you. You have to understand that even though this is a relatively pro-European administration, if you look at the kind of a, uh, the, the leadership at the highest levels, have a lot of experience with Europe, very committed. Um, there is also a belief inside the administration that the pivot to Asia had to continue. And I think that one of the interesting things to play out here will be, does this just arrest that pivot? Or, or does the U.S. kind of see its role in Europe, especially militarily, but also economically, uh, as stronger after this crisis with Ukraine uh, and, and in a more sustainable way than it might have otherwise been? We don't know, but I, I, that's going to be one of the interesting developments. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I might others a question, but I have to, I can't help but asking Richard when he was talking about uh, uh, Ukraine and wh uh, what Ukraine would be willing or not willing to accept as a compromise or go to for a maximalistic um, defense of its original borders. I come from the Balkans where conspiracy theories abound. So the question comes from that angle. Uh, to what extent the American uh, administration or Biden controls or uh, uh, the decisions, uh, political decisions in Ukraine, considering uh, the, uh, the type no, I mean, of support I, well, they're I mean, giving. Well, I, I can do this one of two ways. I can say it controls it in some way, or I can play the economist and say it, it controls it 37.4% uh, of the time. Uh, what I'd say is 
uh, it's malarkey when the State Department stands up and says that this war's uh, uh, conclusion is going to be determined from our side only by the Ukrainians, that it's the Ukrainians that have to decide the term. That's nonsense. Um, and uh, the United States, that little article that you mentioned about the, the, the U.S. feeling it knows more about Russian war plans than it knows about Ukrainian war plans, that was clearly a story that was floated to slap uh, Kiev into uh, providing more information. Uh, we're deeply involved in this, deeply, deeply involved in this. And we have our share of global interests that flow out of the direction in which oil and gas and grain uh, all flow. Um, and I, I guess, you know, again, I'm, I don't want to be sounding facetious or cynical. The fact that the United States has not had foreign troops on the ground for over 200 years, but has engaged in more than 100 instances of deployment of U.S. troops uh, abroad is at, at the heart of this narrative. We do not carry the memories that Europeans do of what it means to go to war. And we have a very simplistic idea of Russia as a geopolitical threat. Um, and we're very much convinced that China, whom we somehow thought we had captured and turned into a cooperative pussycat, um, is an even greater geopolitical threat today. And the preoccupation of the American elites, both the uh, economic and the military and the political elites, is with what will the United States ability be 50 years from now to, to determine a course of action globally that fundamentally benefits the United States. Uh, in, in that sense, it is like any other great power, democratic or non-democratic. Uh, and that debate is at the heart of what's going on right now in Washington, because the calculus has changed from the early uh, hubristic one of helping the little guy against the big bully on the schoolyard uh, and into one of how badly can we let how badly can we see Putin being bloodied up, not just in a short term, but in a long term way that does two things, adds to instability in terms of Putin's control of the regime in Moscow over Russia, and two, forces recalibration of power between the Western Europeans, and in, in this case, in particular, the Germans, but the West Europeans and also the Chinese vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia. The story that we uh, it, it would like to have come out, which we are not willing to talk about, is we'd love to see Putin really badly bloodied. We'd love to see the Ukrainians roll those Russian troops back into Russia. We'd love to see a restive Russia begin to undermine Putin's authority and lead to a weakened Russian state acting in the world. Uh, at the same time, we want both Beijing and Berlin and the rest of Europe to get the message that America is back uh, and that you had better not mistake what has looked like a period of uncertainty and drift for being the America that you will see going forward. Now, we put Donald Trump back in the White House. That whole push is going to blow up uh, yet again. Uh, but I am absolutely convinced that it's at the heart of the unspoken message uh, that, uh, that, that exists in Washington today. I mean, if I could expand on that just a bit, I mean, and I would say this is a minority opinion, but it's my opinion, <laughs> that um, America is in the process of relative decline. And the important word in that sentence is relative. We are not the absolute superpower we once were. There are other superpowers in the world. There is China. There is the remnants of the Soviet Union, which are still very powerful. Europe has grown dramatically in its influence. And I think America as a polity and, and even the elites are having trouble adjusting to the fact that we need to see our role in the world and and conduct our role in the world differently in that because we are, are not we are relatively not the superpower we once were and this is really hard 
because let's face it, most of the people, certainly people like Richard and I of a certain age, we grew up when it was assumed, you know, that, that these are the intellectual assumptions. We might not have agreed with them, but the assumption was we were the boss and everybody else would take orders and we could enforce those orders if they didn't. That's not the case anymore. And uh, bear in mind that for years when I was growing up, certainly, the United States maintained a posture that they could conduct two wars at the same time. We can't do that anymore. Um, and, and so one of the issues that is constantly in the minds of American elites uh, in Washington is, you know, how do we deal with Russia and Ukraine and at the same time maintain the posture we need to maintain with China? And make and make it clear to China that Taiwan is not up for grabs, um, and uh, continue to ex do what we can in the Indo-Pacific to constrain China, to to uh, uh, constrain its ambitions, and uh, th that's a very difficult set of issues to juggle for the elites in Washington right now. And the public is not a player in this. It's a, it's an elite issue, without without a doubt. Um, and um, and and Richard's right. If we get a, a Republican administration back in uh, after the twenty twenty four election, um, you know, all bets are off because uh, uh, if it's Trump and his attitudes towards NATO continue, which there's no reason to believe they wouldn't, um, how things work out in Ukraine could influence what he decides to do. Either, you know, you're, you're big boys now, you can take care of yourself, we're getting out of NATO, or you screwed up Ukraine and we're getting out of NATO because, I mean, you can imagine the excuses he might develop. So I, I think this is, um, this is in that context of, of uh, and I can tell you having just completed in the last year and a half, more than 100 interviews with European elites. This comes up in almost every discussion I have with these people. What's going to happen in 2024? Are you really, can we trust, can we trust you anymore? And this was not the case 10, 15, 20 years ago. And that is a change we're, we just have to live with because frankly, as an American, I can't dissuade them of their concern. I mean, I share the same concerns. So I do think that is that is one of the problems we face going forward. Thank I think you. The other thing, there... Go ahead. I, I, I want to add one thing, which we haven't talked about, which is, you know, in the conduct of uh, competitive power between nations, we focus a lot on military power and state to state military power. And that's absolutely right uh, as a thing to do. But what goes often un, uh, uh, unspoken and, and or misunderstood is the ways in which financial power of a country like the United States represents a battlefield of its own and that the United States is now trying to reconfigure um, and it, it's doing so in a number of ways. But all of this experimentation with sanctions and seizure of assets and seeking to laser target, you know, Putin's alleged girlfriends or wife or whatever, uh, this is all part of a new battlefield that finance is going to uh, play in which the Treasury and the, and the Defense Department are going to find themselves either competing or in cooperation uh, over, the, uh, over the future. And of course, what binds the two of them together technologically is the world of cyber. Both finance and increasingly the future of military combat don't live in physical space. They, they live on the internet, uh, on as pixels showing up on screens. And none of us intellectually has fully been able to understand what that means going forward. One final smaller thought, which is, I cannot believe that Putin and his advisors don't think that if Trump is elected or is reelected um, or is finally given the, the, the place that he, he richly deserved and was stolen from him, that that isn't a good thing for the Russian side of this conflict. Um, I think that you, you, Bruce is absolutely right to assume that 
Trump will come up with a reason, but whatever the reason, it's going to be a cutback in terms of U.S. support for the Ukraine. And whether or not this fulfills a Balkan conspiracy fantasy or not, I don't know, but it fulfills my ideas of geopolitical uh, power. Thank you very much. And, and, and Richard raised the issue of economic sanctions. And I think that what we don't know is what American, the American public's reaction will be to the inability of sanctions to bring Russia to its knees. Because we know from the study of sanctions <laughs> that basically they can make people suffer, but they're not, they don't change, uh, maybe a third of the time they change behavior, but if, if that. And um, um, it's, a, it's a way to express concern and to pressure people, but it's not willing, uh, necessarily going to change their behavior. And that the Russian economy, as much as it may be suffering now, is a long way from the kind of suffering it was suffering at the fall, after the fall of the Soviet Union. Right. And the Russian people have demonstrated historically an ability to suck it up and suffer a great deal. And so I do... I. I, I do think it's an interesting question about as the sanctions continue and lo and behold, the Russians don't come hat in hand and ask for peace, how the public's going to react to that. I just don't know. But I, I, it, it, I think probably the public's expectations of the ability of sanctions to change the situation on the ground are greater than the ability of the sanctions to do that. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? I, I have many, but uh, I don't see any hands. Uh... Well, uh, I want to go back to something that uh, I want to ask both of you. Uh, when I was uh, in the US and seeing these uh, TV programs, it seemed that all the former generals and admirals now have like a uh, wonderful opportunity uh, to uh, upgrade their knowledge because they are in all TV shows like 24 hours a day uh, talking about weapons or what should be done or should not be done, etc. Now, my question is, among the elites that you have done, etc. Now, my question is, among the elites that you talk, uh, that you mentioned, uh, was there any uh, discussion or debate what type of weapons should be provided? Uh, just as an example, a couple of days ago on French TV, there was another uh, former uh, general <laughs> talking about the weapons, and he uh, sustained that one should not uh, send weapons that can shoot over 300 kilometers, because that would mean that they would uh, uh, be able to shoot into Russia, and that that could be dangerous. Uh, and the U.S. is sending more and more sophisticated weapons, and I also read that some of the uh, local fighters use Google translators to understand how these uh, weapons function. Well, this was in the New York Times, actually. Uh, so I'm just wondering, has there been among the elite any debate about what type of uh, weapons uh, should be sent and which weapons are no-go zone? Certainly in the government, they have, they have drawn the line at 300 kilometers uh, at, up to this point. I mean, let's face it. I mean, it, that's, that's the policy today. Who knows what the policy will be tomorrow? Uh, I think you, you actually have hit on something that I was, I was heartened to see that New York Times actually finally read an article about this, is that weaponry is fine. You know, simple weaponry can be picked up and used by conscripts or whatever, but um, the real issue for most of this advanced weaponry, and it, it applies to advanced tanks, it applies to you know this whole debate about airplanes that has now gone away. But at the time, I was surprised that people didn't raise it, is that it takes a long time to train people to use this equipment. And why, and I will say we as journalists, because I was a journalist for 30 years, I mean, that's the kind of thing we should have been focusing on, not necessarily what is being sent, but are how do we train the people to use what we do send them. And especially with things like aircraft, do the Ukrainians have enough pilots? I mean, let's face it, in the past, both in the Battle of Britain and with, with the uh, Germans during World War II, one of the issues was, you know, you could, you could replace an aircraft in maybe a month or a couple of weeks, but you, it may take months to train a pilot. And when the pilot dies, that's not so easily replaceable. And so I do think that that uh, we as journalists 
need to understand that may be one of the bottlenecks going forward is just having enough trained people to actually use this equipment effectively. Because let's face it, some of them, we're going to train it and then some of them are going to get killed. And we have to train some more. So anyway. Yeah. Richard? Well, you know, I think we're, we're getting to the stage where I don't know whether I have a lot that's useful to add to the discussion. My, my general sense, again, is, you know, up until the point that Putin actually sent troops across the border, I was part of the group that said, oh, tr he's just bluffing. He's not going to send troops across the border. Uh, and in that, uh, I was absolutely wrong. And Biden's intelligence and Biden's analysis was right. And so uh, my fallibility is something that ought to be put out here on the table as part of the discussion. Uh, 50 days ago, halfway to the point that we're at now, I did a talk uh, in which I said, look, there are three time periods in which to think of this war ending, each of which has a different play out as a consequence. One is that the two sides find a way to reach an armistice or ceasefire by the fall. The other is that they find it in 2023 or 2024. And the third is that it goes beyond 2024 into an open period in which all kinds of combat is, are taking place but which may not qualify as regular war. Um, some of what we see in the Middle East, for example, now, or we're going to see developing in Afghanistan uh, increasingly. Um, and so we've passed the, the first point that I don't, there's no possibility as far as I can see of a peace treaty of an armistice of a ceasefire between now and the fall. There's at this point only a weak sense that they can come to terms next year uh, because, again, I think that to the degree that Putin is looking at three geopolitical factors, which is how well are the uh, Europeans holding together on these sanction uh, moves to uh, what is China doing to absorb our uh, output and provide us with material that substitutes for what's been cut off. And three, who's going to win the damn election in November 2024? Uh, they'll hold out because of those three factors trying to figure out uh, until they see what the results of the election are. Um, so that then leaves us with the, the third situation. And I think that's the horrifying possibility that we're at, which is America, in some sense, is prepared to fight this war to the last Ukrainian. Um, <laughs> and, and it's a it's a bloodthirsty analysis on my part. And it's not one that I'm proud to be voicing. But I think that it is a real possibility. And this is going to be very disquieting to the Europeans for a whole host of reasons. And it'll be disquieting in different ways to different groups. Uh, and the United States is going to try to manage its way past that. But to the degree that it will focus in a what I'm thinking of as a long war on those points I raised five minutes ago, which is, does it weaken Putin internally? Does it decouple uh, Western Europe, particularly in terms of energy, but in other ways from Russia? And does it screw up Russian-Chinese relations? Those will be the determinants of where the United States will land. And the cost of it, uh, I must assure you, Mariana, is not going to be determinative. Uh, the United States is fully capable of feeding weaponry to the Ukrainians and you know, frankly, as in Vietnam or in Afghanistan, smuggling in either civilian, uh, quote unquote, civilians, uh, uh, or uh, what are supposed to be, uh, as it started out in Vietnam, to be simply military advisors who were non-combatants. Neither of those ended up being what they were supposed to, supposedly going to be, but I suspect that they're part of the calculus uh, of options that, that the Pentagon and the, and the intelligence community are playing with right now. Thank you very much. Not very uplifting, Ivan? Yeah, a, a sort of a, maybe a parochial question. Is the debate within academia and the think tank world similar to what you have been expanding on here as uh, under the, the title elites in, in the US? 
Uh, I sit at the Kennedy School at Harvard Government, so I am confident that, that this conversation fits within the elites in the US. We generate a lot of it. We have a substantial number of people studying as students who are uh, either military personnel of mid-rank who have been selected by the services to come here or are coming out of the national intelligence community. There are always two or three people in the back of my classes who seem to know one hell of a lot about <laughs> contemporary political situations who seem from a distance to be in their 30s or 40s and who when asked say, oh, I work for the national government. Um, so uh, this particular, I, I can't speak for the University of South Dakota, but I can tell you Harvard has got its fingers all over this discussion and in this discussion. Look, I think in the think tank community in Washington, there's there's general uniformity. We don't have the kind of splits between the right and the left as you have in so many issues. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think there's already uh, some uh, discussion about uh, do we need a new Marshall Plan for Ukraine after this is over? Um, uh, there's certainly uh, continued concern about China. Uh, you know, I think that parts of the think tank community that were Asian focused are kind of, you know, been put on the back burner for, for the moment. Uh, the European focused uh, think tanks like the German Marshall Fund have found a new a, a role in life, uh, basically. Yeah. Um, uh, what is interesting to me, it seems to me, in, in, in those discussions is the attempt by, and as you know, Yvonne and, and Richard knows this too, I mean, think tanks are not, I mean, they're an assortment of people, there's South Asian experts, and there's China experts, and there are European experts, and Latin American experts, and they're all, I think, trying now to scramble, and I am totally understand, to make their issue and part of the world relevant to what everybody really cares about, which is Ukraine at this right. moment, right? So how is an Indian expert uh, gonna play in this game? Well, it's because India is not really taking sides in this, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, other issues are, are put aside for the, for the moment. Yeah, so to follow up on, on that, Bruce and Richard, the, how, how is this seen that, you know, to speak simply again, that half of the world is quote unquote neutral or, you know, waiting on the sidelines to see what happens? And in, obviously there's, there's been cajoling of the Indians and, you know, the, the quad meeting where Modi was there with Biden, et cetera. So I, I don't think that it's playing a particularly large role whatsoever. In fact, I wouldn't guess that more than 30% of Americans know that we've had a hard time getting some of these countries to sign up. And frankly, given America's particular hegemonic worldview, not having India as a partner doesn't mean a lot uh, one way or the other. It's like, well, what 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 uh, what, what was it Stalin's remark or where are popes where are the popes divisions? Uh, it's like, where, where are Modi's divisions is what uh, Washington wants to know. Um, so I, I, I don't think that the, the fact that there is global hesitation uh, is even a factor in the public's view of any significance and is probably even known as a, as a fact by no more than a third of the populace. No, look, I, I think Richard's right. I think there's probably... I know of no question ever asked of the public. And I, frankly, if you ask the question, people would be, what? I don't have any idea, you know? I, I, now I do think that the way this plays in, Ivan, is there are questions that have been asked of the public, which show that the American public believes that we do everything and nobody else does anything, right? Woe is us, we are the victims of other countries kind of ignoring these things. We have to bear the world's burden. So there's this, there is this sense of, victimhood by the world uh, on among the American public. And it, it, Pew has asked this question multiple times. Majority of the public says, you know, we do everything, no, nobody else does anything. So it would fit right into that narrative. Now, in on this case, it, there's a certain truth to that narrative, but um, I can tell you among official, officialdom, there is real frustration, right? I mean, there is a real sense that the Indians and the South Africans and others, um, uh, are not being as supportive as we would like them to be, uh, are trying to, I mean, 
I've heard people even raise the issue of, you know, the non-aligned movement is re-emerging here. Uh, maybe a little extreme, but, you know, it's, it, it's the, the context in which people see it. Um, and uh, whether that will have an impact in the future uh, in terms of a specific issue that we deal with with India or South Africa, I'm kind of doubtful because we have other interests with those countries that we don't want to jeopardize because we're frustrated with what they did about Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but, you know, I assume there will be some people who will say, oh, you're having trouble on your Tibetan border with the Chinese? Good luck with that one. You know, <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't stand up to the Russians. Um, I doubt that people are going to say that in, uh, that would be official policy. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that in the backs of people's minds, there is some frustration along those lines. Well, we did say that in 1962 while we were preoccupied we with Cuba. That's exactly yes. what we told the Indians. Well, good luck. <laughs> Good luck. You're on your own here, guys. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I do think that uh, it's probably playing out in the minds of the Indians and the South Africans and others is it's part of this whole thing of the relative power of the United States is changing. And, and do we really want to get in bed fully with the U.S. on some of these issues and, and Europe for that matter? Um, uh, and, and look, I, if I were them, I would it'd be an issue at least that would come to my mind. I think, uh, even, uh, that, uh, Richard and Bruce, Bruce and Richard have given really such a fantastic context. The only problem is it's not very promising and it's not very optimistic. That's the only, uh, but at least uh, we understand a little bit, a little better, uh, the United States and we shall definitely be doing more events uh, about the United States. Uh, but we try to understand, we need to understand this in order to understand what to expect here in Europe and when it comes to the European, uh, to the uh, war in Ukraine in particular. Uh, before I pass the word to Ivan, I would just like to say that our next event is on the 28th of June, and it is exactly uh, the uh, <laughs> I, do, I don't want to say the opposite, but it is the other angle. We shall uh, have five or six speakers who will explain the political context or what has been the impact of the war in Ukraine on political discourse in certain European countries. And that is Poland, that is uh, Finland, uh, that is Italy, that is Czech Republic, it's Bulgaria, and may have uh, another one, and I shall send you. I thank you, Bruce, I thank you, Richard. I am sure we shall be talking again in the future, uh, because uh, as uh, Richard told us, this is gonna go on for uh, until 24. I really hope we are still around to keep discussing it. <laughs> yeah, no, tra tra tragically, the wars of the world seem to be uh, uh, evergreens for uh, for the talking classes. So, yeah. Ivan, <laughs> thank you. I can only echo uh, Miriam's words. We're we're at the end of our uh, hour and a half, and uh, a, a huge thanks to both Richard and, and Bruce, who've really. Uh, dug deep to enlighten us on where the United States stands, both in terms of public opinion and in terms of, of the policymakers and the academic and, and think tank world, and, and given us depth, historical depth, uh, to understand uh, where the United States is. Uh, the transatlantic community, uh, whatever the problem, still stands strong. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, obviously uh, bickering, you know, the Trump years have, have been a wake up uh, call and a sobering moment for, for Europe. Uh, yes, the US is back with the Biden administration. And as I think, as, as Bruce said, we all know that this is probably the administration that knows Europe best, uh, where a lot of people do speak French, for example, or German. Uh, my, my, our former boss, Bruce, uh, Karen Dunkley, who is the assistant secretary, uh, and, and Blinken and, and others are, are really true European, pro-European in, in the sense of, of the transatlantic democratic value-based community. But, uh, the, the world is, is challenged hugely. Um, I fall into the category of, of, of Richard. I did not predict 
uh, as I think 95% of, of people who deem themselves to be experts did not predict, you know, our maximum, I think, was, okay, he'll fortify the Donbass and, and maybe try to make that land bridge uh, through Mariupol. That, that's as far as we went, I think. But uh, to, to see what, what has happened and simply you wake up every morning and you say, is this really happening? It is. The world has changed. This is... Uh, akin to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Nothing is the same after February the 24th, and we're living it. We're trying to understand where it's going. And I think both Richard and, and Bruce has, have given us uh, directions and, and scenarios. That's very helpful because we're all in this exercise. So thanks. Uh, Miriana announced the next uh, event. Um, it will probably be in the morning in Europe, but uh, Bruce, Richard, if you're interested to see how it reflects, in the six European countries, uh, uh, you're, you're absolutely welcome. But I can send you, you the recording too, so you don't yeah, have to get up you. at three in the there morning. There will be a recording indeed, thank you. And, and thank you, of course, to all of you who are online. Uh, a lot of you were there until the, the bitter end of this, um, and we invite you to, to follow us. Thank, and Mariana, thank you. You are really the one who puts this uh, together, even though we, we choose people together. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a nice day or the nice evening. Thank you very Thanks much. Bye-bye.